74,000 years ago, our world witnessed an eruption unprecedented in human history. On the Indonesian island of Sumatra, a volcano blew its top with such force it would reshape the entire planet. The Toba supervolcano eruption was an event unlike any other. While dozens of supervolcanoes have gone off in the course of Earth's history, Toba remains the one to be witnessed by humans. Spitting out enough debris to bury an area the size of the United States, it was tens of thousands of times bigger than Mount St. Helens. Huge swaths of Asia were lost beneath burning debris. Ash rained down as far away as Lake Malawi, some 7,000 kilometers distant. It was simply the mother of all eruptions. But what effects did this explosion have on the rest of the planet? Until recently, it was thought that the Toba catastrophe nearly wiped out humankind, reducing our species to as few as a thousand individuals. Now, though, startling evidence has emerged that humans not just survived Toba's aftermath, but actually thrived. Today, we're examining the eruption and the aftermath of human history's greatest supervolcano. If you were to go hiking through the mountains of northern Sumatra, you might just stumble across a special lake. An elongated stretch of blue water with a vast island in the middle, Lake Toba is today a tourist attraction. The sort of peaceful place you might unwind after escaping the city. But this tranquility is just an illusion. Deep in the region's past, a violent cataclysm took place here, one forceful enough to not just create the lake itself, but to lay waste to the continent. Known as the Toba event, it was the biggest supervolcano eruption in the last two million years. Although we know of nearly 50 super eruptions in Earth's history, supervolcanoes themselves are actually pretty rare. There are only thought to be six currently in existence, the most famous of which lies below Yellowstone National Park. The term supervolcano didn't even enter popular usage until the 21st century, and it's only recently been defined in a scientific sense. To get the most out of the story of Toba, it's important we understand exactly what that definition is. Volcanoes are measured using something known as the Volcanic Explosivity Index, or VEI, which basically does for giant fire spewing mountains what the Richter scale does for earthquakes. Running from 0 to 8, it measures the amount of debris a volcano hurls into the air in cubic kilometers, rising each time by a factor of 10. So at VEI 1, you have eruptions that pump out a mere 0.001 cubic kilometers of burning death, while VEI 2 eruptions pump out up to 0.01 cubic kilometers, VEI 3 up to 0.1, and so on and so forth. We should point out here that it's totally possible to have a volcano with a VEI of 0 that still manages to be destructive, like those ones in Hawaii that leak lava all over people's lawns without actually exploding. But the general rule of thumb is the higher a volcano's VEI, the more destructive it is. By the time you reach level 8, meaning over a thousand cubic kilometers of nightmare horror is sent spewing forth, you're likely talking a planet-wide catastrophe. It's at VEI-8 that we enter into the realm of supervolcanoes. Now, if you're anything like us, you probably find this VEI stuff both interesting, but also just a bit hard to grasp. So we're going to try and take a moment here to help you get your heads around just how psycho-crazy Toba-style VEI-8 blasts are by gently moving up the scale and comparing eruptions. Let's start with an eruption that everyone's heard of, Mount St. Helens. On May the 18th, 1980, the United States experienced the deadliest, most destructive volcanic event in its history. In one Washington state, Mount St. Helens blew its top, killing 57 people, wiping out 250 homes, and flattening 600 square kilometers of trees. If you're above a certain age, you'll always certainly remember the catastrophe as a bit of a massive deal. But not according to the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Destructive as it was, Mount St. Helens barely clocked in at a VEI of 5. The blast released almost exactly one cubic kilometer of tephra, the lowest possible for a VEI 5 eruption. So, if a low VEI-5 is capable of Mount St. Helensing a region, 
What might a VI-6 do? Well, the answer to that came in the summer of 1883. That August, Krakatoa exploded with a bang so loud it circled the planet four whole times. The eruption killed over 36,000 people and sent tsunamis crashing into coasts thousands of kilometers away. If Mount St. Helens were like stubbing your toe, then Krakatoa was like stepping on a landmine, an event of such greater magnitude that the two just aren't really comparable. And at this stage, we've only moved up one level on the VEI scale, and already we've seen massive differences. But we're still two levels shy of a supervolcano. Now let's move up to VEI 7. Eruptions of such rare destructive power that there's only been one inaugural blast of this size in the last 2,000 years, Tambora in 1815. And what a blast it was. Although Tambora was initially less deadly than Krakatoa, killing a mere 10,000 people, its after effects were world changing. So much stuff spewed out that the planet cooled, turning 1816 into the year without a summer. Ice froze European rivers in August. In Virginia, it snowed on the 4th of July. Crops across the planet failed, leading to over 80,000 indirect deaths. To return to our metaphor, if Krakatoa was stepping on a landmine, then Tambora was clambering atop a giant pile of TNT and casually dropping a lit cigarette. All of which finally brings us to supervolcanoes. Just as Mount St. Helens was nothing against Krakatoa, so Tambora would be a mere firefly fluttering next to the inferno of a super eruption. A VEI-8 event is simply so big that it dwarfs every other volcanic eruption in human history, like comparing catching a cold to dying of Spanish flu. And now that we've finally wrapped our heads around just how colossal these eruptions are, it's time to look at the biggest in human history, Toba. It's often said that Toba is the only supervolcano eruption in history, but if you're watching this from New Zealand, you might heartily disagree with that assessment. After all, Lake Taupo on North Island gave off a glorious level 8 eruption about 26,500 years ago, far more recent than the Toba blast. The big difference is that no humans, Neanderthals, or any of their siblings had yet arrived in New Zealand when Taupo went up. Asia, by contrast, was already populated when Toba blew its top. It's likely there were even early humans with front row seats. In 2017, ancient human teeth were found in Sumatra, dating from around the time of the Toba event. But even if they arrived slightly later, there were still ancient Homo sapien cousins like Homo floresiensis, aka the Indonesian hobbits, living locally. Toba then is unique in that it's the only supervolcano eruption that had an impact directly witnessed by our ancestors. And boy, did Toba ever have a lot of impact. The run-up to Toba's catastrophic blast was punctuated by a series of smaller eruptions. Around 1.2 million years ago, and again around 500,000 BC, two VEI-6 blasts tore through Sumatra, the stepping on a landmine or Krakatoa level from our scale previously. If you came into this video assuming that supervolcano always meant super eruption, this might come as a bit of a surprise to you. But the reality is that supervolcanoes don't normally blow at full capacity. Yellowstone, for example, has only three super eruptions in its history, but hundreds more that didn't quite qualify as a level eight. So Toba was very much active when early humans arrived in Indonesia. Unfortunately, they had no way of knowing this. With writing still a hell of a long way off from being invented, there were no records or signs saying, warning, don't live near this fiery murder mountain. What there were were natural warning signs, ones that ironically may have served to draw early humans to the island. Signs like rich volcanic soil that made Sumatra such a paradise. Signs like the rumblings that its thought began periodically echoing out of Toba in the centuries before its cataclysmic blast. Perhaps the run-up to the final eruption was marked by a growing sense of dread among whatever tribes inhabited Sumatra's dense rainforests. A panic that swept through its members as the mountains started doing stranger and stranger things. Maybe they invented rituals to appease the mountain god, or maybe there was no warning, just a normal, regular day that became a catastrophe. All we know for certain is that circa 72,000 BC, the Toba volcano exploded with a force unprecedented in the last two million years. The blast was big enough to vaporize any mountain top that may have stood there, leaving behind a crater almost 100 kilometers long. Gigantic clouds of hot ash billowed out at high speed, a wall of death superheated to over 1,100 degrees Celsius, traveling at 320 kilometers an hour. Anything that pyroclastic flow touched would have died instantly, burned up, and buried 
in a fraction of a second. Running would have been useless, hiding unless in a very deep cave, only likely to prolong your agony. As the ash spewed out, burying Sumatra, the scale of the carnage would have been incomprehensible. Who knows how many tribes with all their culture and history perished in those first moments. Yet as bad as this was, it was only the beginning. The Toba eruption would soon affect not only Sumatra, not only Asia, but the entire world. To say prehistoric Indonesia was an unpleasant place to be after the Toba eruption is a little like saying being exiled to Siberia isn't a barrel of laughs. Thick ash would have fallen across the islands, grey and deadly. While it looks like gunky snow in pictures, volcanic ash is nowhere near so light and fluffy. It's heavy as hell, able to collapse structures. Breathe it in and it forms a mixture in your lungs akin to cement. Anyone who breathed the Toba ash would have suffocated. At the same time, that ash would be poisoning fresh water sources it landed in and turning the sea around Indonesia into a sickly sludge. But the effects were felt much further away than just Sumatra's immediate neighborhood. So much ash spewed forth from Toba that a layer five centimeters thick is thought to have fallen on India over 5,000 kilometers away. At such thickness, it would have killed off vegetation and likely triggered all sorts of terrible floods. To put that in perspective, this would be like a volcano that erupted in Ecuador, blanketing Chicago with ash and killing wildlife in Lake Michigan. And India wasn't even the furthest place affected. Ash deposits from Toba have been discovered in Lake Malawi, a distance of over 7,000 kilometers, almost exactly the distance separating Mount Etna in Italy from Rhode Island. At both the North and South Poles, it's thought sulfuric acid rained down. The volcanic gases that escaped Toba, meanwhile, circled the entire world. There were undoubted climactic effects. A 2009 study found that entire forests probably died in central India as a result of the super eruption. For a long time, some scientists thought humanity almost died out too. The Toba catastrophe theory first appeared in the early 1990s, both as a result of studying Toba itself and as a result of studying genetics. As researchers ran computer models to predict the effects of Toba, they found the eruption may have caused global temperatures to plunge by up to 15 degrees Celsius. 15 degrees Celsius. When you realize how worked up people are by the thought of the climate warming by a mere 3 Celsius, you realize how dramatic this would have been. In some papers, it was suggested that the Toba event was so powerful, the global cooling may have lasted for a thousand years. Around the same time, other scientists working with human mitochondrial DNA discovered what appeared to be a genetic bottleneck occurring between 50,000 and 100,000 years ago. It wasn't long before researchers began to wonder if one hadn't caused the other. The theory that emerged was one of the grimmest and most chilling ever proposed. It suggested that the Toba event had been so big and its effects on the climate so drastic that nearly all humans perished in its volcanic winter. At its most extreme, the theory suggested humans got down to as few as a thousand breeding pairs. That's an incredibly tiny number, so small it's dwarfed by the number of daily customers in your average Walmart. If true, it would mean that we humans had tiptoed up to the very edge of extinction and peered into the abyss, only to step back at the last possible second. However, it's a very big if. While the Toba catastrophe theory became wildly popular in the 2000s, with everyone from NPR to Cracked covering it, current research suggests a rather different story, one that's staggering in its implications. Rather than nearly dying out in the wake of Toba, humanity may not have only survived, but also thrived. The idea that Toba caused a planet cooling disaster seems so intuitive that it can be hard to shake off. After all, the 1815 Tambora eruption screwed things up for an entire year, all while being just a fraction of the size of the Toba blast. Yet there are good reasons to think Toba's effects weren't as far reaching as the catastrophe theory suggests, and one of them has to do with magma. Not all magmas are created equal. Depending on the volcano, it can be capable of holding very different amounts of dissolved sulfur and carbon dioxide. This is important because sulfur dioxide is one of the key ingredients for a volcanic winter, the type that might cause a massive population crash. Basically, a whole ton of it in the atmosphere can backscatter the sun's radiation, a fancy way of saying that it stops it from reaching the ground and therefore cools the planet. But chemical analysis of Toba's ash has recently suggested that its magma can't hold much sulfur. That means a Toba blast probably has less effect on global temperature than a similar-sized eruption from a different volcano. There's evidence for this lack of impact in ancient coastal sites found in South Africa. 
Recent excavations identified a layer of minuscule glass shards created in the superheated inferno of Toba and subsequently scattered across much of the world. This means it's easy to tell which artifacts were buried before the blast and which ones after. At both sites in South Africa, there was clear evidence of more human activity after Toba went off, more tool building, more early attempts at art, and more food being eaten. In other words, the exact opposite of what you'd expect from an apocalyptic 1,000-year winter. Similar evidence has turned up in India, adding credence to the theory that Toba's volcanic winter was relatively mild. The evidence is so compelling that today the Toba catastrophe theory appears to be on its way out, a relic of the 1990s when we believed in all sorts of weird crap like the Millennium Bug or Wayne's World somehow being superior to Bill and Ted. No. Way. Still, the theory does retain some supporters who point out a severe volcanic winter may have driven humans to seek refuge on Africa's coasts, hence the increased activity at such sites. And really, it's not our place to make a judgment call. We're not qualified volcanologists. All we can do is report what the current scientific consensus is and let you make up your own minds. But even if the Toba catastrophe was the Chinese democracy of eruptions, overhyped and ultimately forgettable, it would still have had a significant impact on Southeast Asia. Many communities would have been wiped out, and even those that survived would have lived through an era so craptacular it could compete for the title of worst decade in history. All of which brings us to a rather inevitable and chilling question. Could it happen again? Could something reawaken the Toba supervolcano and cause it to unleash an unwanted sequel on humanity? The terrifying answer is that we can't say no for sure. Of all the infamous volcanoes we've name-checked in this video, three of them, Krakatoa, Tambora, and of course Toba, all exist in modern Indonesia. That's thanks to Indonesia's prime position on the Pacific Ring of Fire, a gigantic swath of geologically active territory running up the America's west coasts and down Asia's east coast that's home to 75% of the world's volcanoes. It's also where 90% of the planet's earthquakes take place, thanks to a whole load of faults crisscrossing the landscape. One of those faults, the Great Sumatran Fault, runs directly through Mount Toba. This is a bit of a worry, because if the Sumatran Fault ever becomes particularly active, it could reawaken Toba's dormant magma chamber. If that happens, then you're suddenly not only dealing with a massive earthquake, but also Toba's first potential super-eruption in 74,000 years. Scarily, we might not get very much warning before that happens. We kind of assume we'd see another Toba blast coming, giving us enough time to mass evacuate Sumatra. But that's not guaranteed. It's possible the only warning we'll have is, hey, is it just me or is Lake Toba starting to, and then there'd be a very loud bang. Even if there's enough time to evacuate, the eruption would still be devastating. Sumatra is home to nearly 60 million people and is about twice the size of the UK. Huge swaths of it would be devastated by superheated pyroclastic flows and then blanketed in ash, causing untold chaos. The city of Medan, for example, is home to both 2 million people and only 140 kilometers away from Lake Toba. Even if you got everyone out before the mega boom, you'd still have to deal with 2 million displaced people whose homes are now buried under a pile of burning horribleness. And Medan is just the start of your problems. The Malaysian capital of Kuala Lumpur is a little over 300 kilometers away, while Singapore is also close enough to start panicking. Remember, the ash from Toba's last super eruption was destructive some 5,000 kilometers distant. At only 300 and 500 kilometers away, Kuala Lumpur and Singapore may as well be built right on top of the magma chamber. However, their ultimate fates would depend on which way the wind was blowing. Remember the hobbits we mentioned earlier who lived in Indonesia at the time of the last Toba eruption? Well, Homo floresiensis was barely impacted thanks to the wind blowing all the ash away from them. While anyone within 100 kilometers of Toba when it erupted would be dead no matter what, what happened to everyone else would depend on whether the ash cloud headed towards civilization or out to sea. If it was blown east towards Malaysia, Singapore, and the rest of Indonesia, then we'd see carnage on an unprecedented scale. Trees and crops would be killed as the ash fell down, animals would ingest toxic chemicals dying by the millions, water supplies would become undrinkable, electricity lines would come crashing down, and transport and therefore escape would become impossible. It would be a humanitarian disaster, one that killed untold numbers and paralyzed Southeast Asia for months or even years. On top of that, 
it would also crash the global economy. As we've seen with COVID, disrupting global supply chains tends to screw everyone, and supply chains out of Asia would be disrupted on a scale vaster than even what we experienced in 2020. So, yeah, Toba super eruption, not the funnest thing ever. But what if we could somehow ensure no supervolcano on Earth ever erupted again? Not so very long ago, NASA scientists sat down to solve the problem of supervolcanoes for good. Using Yellowstone as their model, they estimated that the 35% increase in heat transfer out of the magma chamber would stop it from ever exploding. To do this, all you'd have to do would be drill down into the supervolcano and start pumping in high-pressure water. With every passing moment, more heat would be extracted until, way over a hundred years after the project first started, the magma would be cool enough to end the threat of an eruption for good. It sounds like science fiction, but it's theoretically possible even now, and it could be a way to neutralize our planet's supervolcanoes for good. Because make no mistake, these dormant monsters will explode again one day. It may not be for tens of thousands of years, or even for hundreds of thousands, but somewhere in Earth's future. There's a dark day waiting for us, a day when the sky turns black and an annihilating wall of fire spews out of the ground, destroying everything in its path. Right now, Toba remains the only super eruption ever witnessed by humanity. We can only pray that it stays that way. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.